This is artist Lisa Corinne Davis. She's an award-winning artist whose paintings have been exhibited across the world and live in collections at the MoMA, among many other museums and galleries. How was the drive? Lisa was temporarily working upstate during the pandemic. And today, her paintings have come back home to her studio in Bushwick. The first wave of the pandemic was full of uncertainty and fear. And everyone is dealing with it in their own way. It's a huge tragedy. But there are many other things in life that artists have to overcome. How can we incorporate all of the challenges in our lives into our work? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I'm Sophia. Lisa. Great to meet you. Did you finish all these in this past year? Not all of them, but I, I'm a really slow painter, and something about this lockdown has been good. So I'd say about uh, a little, half of these have been done. Wow. These are beautiful. <laughs> They're on panel and canvas? Panel and canvas, yeah. The panel, the paint sits on top. Mm. And the canvas, it sinks in and gives a different kind of atmosphere. So I go back and forth, but mostly on canvas. Do you like the bounce on the canvas? I don't have a bounce. I, okay. I have a, a board behind it. Oh, nice. Because I can't have a bounce because of all the detail work. It Drawing. would be, yeah be too much. They remind me of like a cartographer tripping yeah. on acid or something. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they're loosely to refer to maps or locations, but, mm. but the tripping part I love because they're supposed to disorient and mm. not let anyone have a place to really land or stand or, or be. It's, it's like two languages that mm -hmm. I think are part of abstraction. One is when we trust, which is the kind of um, geometry and straight lines and measured things and grids. And the other that we feel is more um, bodily and psychological drips and organic shapes, etc. So I kind of just keep weaving those two components together in the paintings until it gets to a layer of enough complication, then I stop. I wanted them to be a little toxic, you know, a little disquieting, so they're not um, pleasant. It seems like with abstract art, it, it kind of, people want to <laughs> make a meaning from it. Sure. Um, and it can have, it's so versatile because it can have some right, meanings. But right. there's something about the way you paint that makes it feel that there's really a specific mm -hmm. sentence that I need to perceive or understand. Like I want to, I find myself trying to construct a really specific meaning from right. this. Right, and that's good because that's what I want. The painting started with people doing that to me as a person. Mm. Like, because of my visual appearance, like um, wanting to figure out who I, what the signifiers are of uh, uh, race, basically. Mm. As an African-American artist, do you find it difficult to not make work that's overtly political? Yeah, I mean. Is that a choice? Yes and no. Um, or because, is this overtly political? Well, I can't see it. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's political in the sense that the ideas are political, but it's personal. It's like a, I mean, I was describing them to a student yesterday, weirdly, as self-portraits, because yes, I'm African-American, but I grew up in a, a first a, a black neighborhood, then moved to an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. I went to a Quaker school. I married a white man, Canadian. Uh, so it's like my story has, 
has nothing and some things to do with the African-American story, right? Mm. But it's, it's not a blueprint. I've been trying to figure out where do I settle? Like I'm, I'm slightly uncomfortable in any clear zone of identity. You know, I'm just slightly uncomfortable in it because I've never lived in those clear zones of identity. interested in talking about my experience and my experience as a lived felt experience and that experience is best communicated through abstraction which is a felt experience. So okay let's talk more about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm curious because I'm an artist too mm -hmm. and when I found out that I wasn't allowed to access my studio anymore. Right. I about flipped out. So what did you do? I had to move into my apartment and I had did to paint you move your work smaller. In? I, yeah. I was painting. My, I couldn't bring a big table. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had everything out and yeah. I was trying. I just knew I, if I didn't get to my studio, I would lose my mind. And I had this luxury of this studio upstate, right? So mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't sure about anything. Like, I'm sure you weren't. Like, how travel would work, how, if I could get here, how dangerous that would feel. So, like, upstate, I knew I could leave the door of the house and walk to the barn, and the work would be there. That's so, amazing. I just packed it all up and just moved there and just kept going. So, in a sense, I mean, I feel guilty because it's like, I don't know, I'm reading all these articles now about the people who ran away. But, um, and I don't want to be one of those people. But anyway, um, so, uh, but um, I kind of was able to put myself in a bubble. Uh, okay. Did you, so you weren't productive in your apartment? I, I tried to dip into painting, but it was really, I don't know. I think I'm still trying to shrug off my master's program. <laughs> Just trying to. <laughs> Get it off me, I'm trying to screw it. <laughs> Where'd so, you go for? I went to the academy, New York Academy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And now I teach at Pratt. Right. And so I'm still in the academic system. Yeah. I don't know. How do you find teaching? Well, well that was interesting um, because I also teach at Hunter College and um, I just had to drop my whole course that I taught before. Mm. Because I do think when the world blows up like this, it's a time of reassessment, right? Yeah. So I said to the students, you just can't, you gotta let go of what you did before and think about how to make this limited zone that you're in useful for you. And they really like, like had a terrible time with this. Like they were like, I need my studio, I need my stuff, I need my, you know, and I luckily could arrange that, but they couldn't. They were in apartments, the studios of Hunter were shut down. So I said, let's just like work on one thing for a semester, whatever you can do, and like just write about it every week and talk about why you did it, what you were thinking about. So you just had a shift and it was more about, let's talk about processing this. Yeah, and we talked about the apocalypse. Wow. Like, and what that is <laughs> and what it means. And it's not the worst thing on the planet. It's a big destruction that leads to something. And I'm in this privileged place where I get to hear and listen to younger people think. Like how it, mm. how, you know, cause like culture changes and what? I wouldn't be as alert to it if I weren't in a classroom with them. So, I mean, I'm a woman. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> cool. There's, I know, I'm so aware of the pressures of being an artist and potentially having children. Yeah. And that is such a hard dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's difficult because it's a you have to stretch yourself and still be grounded. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what what's that what that is like? Yeah. you have two children. I have two children, Davis, who draws, and my daughter, who wisely just started law school. So, <laughs> so we expect <laughs> her to like support us all someday. Um, no, I mean I um, I as a young woman, I didn't want children. Like I had. 
I didn't understand them, I had no relationship to them, whatever. But when I met my husband, I, I you know, fell in love, I wanted children, but I really thought it was gonna be the end of the, my art. Having a kid is an excuse to not do anything. Like you, you have the ultimate excuse. Like I have so much to do here. Right. I, I, I can't do this. I can't. It can provide the excuse for stopping your life. And then I thought, well, then what happens? Oh, then I become this angry, miserable person, right? So then my children are being raised by this resentful, angry, miserable person. So I realized I had to make it happen. So. When, when Davis was a baby, um, like literally a baby, I came home from the hospital, I put him in like a, a bassinet and I started drawing. I thought if I only get an hour a day, wow. whenever he's sleeping, I'm drawing. Okay, I couldn't use oil paint, I couldn't roll around in it, I couldn't cover myself in it, I didn't have a studio, but I drew. And then uh, I had a supportive husband who was good about giving me some time. But I realized like in the teaching front also, in my fellow female professors, um, on the studio side, I'm the only one that has children. And when I was at Yale, I was the only one that had children. And I realized at Yale with that commute, I could never go in and say, sorry, I'm late because I have these two children. So I never used them as an excuse. It was a complete juggle it probably did not do well for the health of my marriage, you know, which ended. It's not an easy navigation, but in the end, I think having children for me made me a more complete person, a more complicated person, but uh, it was kind of brutal for a long time. You know, you've just got to restructure how to feed the growth of your overall work and not have some preset plan that this has to happen in this way at this time. Mm. I think that's what's important. So do you think you'll have children? You know, it sounds great. <laughs> it is great. <laughs> uh, I have my fears. I have my fears because of everything that you said, yeah. you know, and yeah. I, I can't, I think I'm still trying to figure out who I am mm -hmm. and what kind of artist I am. Yeah. And I don't know if there is going to be a perfect time. Mm -hmm. There isn't. It's just not a rational thing. But ultimately, I think the more you know and the more you live, the better your work is. It's like all that is material that comes into the work ultimately. I left Lisa's studio full of hope and inspiration. She is such a powerhouse of accomplishment, but she doesn't take any of it for granted. And as artists, we have to work so hard in the city to get anywhere, and we follow this abstract path full of many unknowns. But what we have at the end is the culmination of our greatest passions and relationships. And this is what this flowing journey through the studios and homes of artists has taught me. The artist's life is a constant transformation. Hard work, tenacity, invention, a rewarding inconvenience. And isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm.